Okay, uh, we cannot start this session. I'm Dr. Bachan and Dr. Goff are moderators. Uh, this session, we're going to talk about the frozen shoulder, the treatment of the frozen shoulder. There are many inconclusive issues of the frozen shoulder. So we're going to see uh, the trend of the treatment in our Asian society. All right. I'm Dr. Goff, Tanti Sijalun Kun from Somdet Papin Krao Navy Hospital. For this session, we will uh, have four experienced shoulder uh, surgeons from different countries uh, who, who will share their own practice in the treatment of the frozen shoulder. This session will be divided into two parts. For the first part, they will talk about the conservative treatment, and the second part will be the surgical treatment, and after that, we will have time for the question and answer. Each speaker will have six minutes to present for each part. All right, let's start with the um, Dr. Siti Hawa Tahir from Malaysia. Dr. Siti, the stairs is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Siti Hawa. I'm from Malaysia, Hospital Kuala Lumpur, the uh, largest public hospital in the country. Okay, now, I have some, a bit of introduction on what shoulder is all about. Okay, as everyone knows, frozen shoulder is a condition of a diseased joint capsule which involves chronic inflammatory response where the capsule, mainly the rotator interval, undergoes inflammation. It becomes fibrotic and contractured, characterized by global limitation of movement, especially the uh, forward elevation and the external rotation. It has been said that the pathology starts with the capsule first, where it becomes thickened and then it gets contractured. The crocohemoral ligament and the posterior IGHL follow suit before the rotator interval gets involved. And usually, it's quite common to have the biceps to be involved as well at a certain extent. It's just a matter of mildly affected or severe. Now, uh, when we talk about frozen shoulder, we have several phases here. Phase one can start with gradual onset of pain, Source can be from the biceps, but range of motion remains still the same. Now, in phase two, where is this the most painful period? In the acute phase, where inflammation can be severe, patient can sleep, cannot eat, and can be severe enough to disturb daily function. In phase three, when it becomes chronic, the inflammation starts to decrease, but the rotator interval becomes less uh, mobile means it gets contracted and the capsule becomes tight. Range of motion is now limited, but because of less, less movement means less pain. So phase four is when the shoulder is stiff. This is the time when the inflammation is already over. So now, uh, by understanding the pathophysiology and the natural history of this condition, treatment strategy should be in place so I choose conservative treatment for those cases in the early stage or in phase one. I would send them for physical therapy. At the very least is to actually uh, re not let it become worse. And uh, I sent for, for pain modalities for range of motion exercises. Steroids injection, yes, it is commonly performed, especially if the pain is very severe and intolerable. So I give them NSAIDs, although it's not so effective in reducing inflammation, but I give it as analgesics. At least the patient can carry out daily function with tolerable pain. So what about hydrodilatation? Yes, I do send some of these patients uh, to my sports physician colleague uh, for hydrodilatation. So this involves uh, injection of some volume, high volume of saline. 
Oral steroids? Mm, no, I don't like to give oral steroids to my patients. Sometimes, as I mentioned, hydrodilatation can help in certain number of patients. This involves uh, injection of high volume of saline, usually about 20 to 30 mils, into the targeted area. It's targeted at the contracted area, which is the rotator interval and the uh, anterior capsule. And the aim is actually to force the pressure into the capsule as to make it ruptures. Yes, it can be painful, but most of the time it is well tolerated because the injection is combined with the steroids and local analgesia as well. So I usually would not consider uh, this uh, in a very stiff shoulder or in a chronic, very chronic patients or when the range of motion is very, very limited. Some of the shoulder exercises that I would advise patients uh, to do, this can be, can be done at home actually. Uh, since the external rotation and the forward elevation are mostly affected in such condition, so the focus is to increase these two movements most of the time. Cross body exercises is to stretch the posterior, finger walk up the wall to stretch the inferior capsule. You can use the towel stretch or even can use the stick for this purpose. That is to stretch the anterior structures. Pendulum exercises as in the scular motion. And this should all help to stretch all the tight structures in the joint. So patient can also do pulley exercises of which it is I would encourage patient to do at home as in active assisted forward elevation to stretch the inferior capsule as well. And on the left, uh, you can see, uh, I would usually ask patient to use stick exercises uh, to get their external rotation going so that it is, become, it's, it is more mobile. So with that is my conservative treatment for frozen shoulder. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Siti, uh, for your great presentation. And next speaker will be Dr. Pachan Banchasuk uh, from Thailand. Yes, Dr. Pachan, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siti. Give us about the detail of the frozen shoulder and all the conservative treatment options. I think that the, all the conservative treatment options are helpful, but for the refractory case, learning, <laughs> oh, okay. But for the refractory case, I prefer the triple nerve box with manipulation. The main innovation of the gain or hemorrhoid joints are the super scapular nerve, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> which uh, innervates the superior capsule and the posterior capsule. Axillary nerve innervates inferior capsule, and the lateral pectoral nerve innervates anterior capsule. But the most important is the super scapular nerve, which provides about 70% of sensation to the gain or hemorrhoid joint. There are many evidences of the super scapular nerve block for the frozen shoulder such as the suprascapular nerve block compared to the intraarticular steroid injection. Combine the suprascapular nerve block with other treatment options compared to the isolated ones and the manipulation under the suprascapular nerve block. All of these studies found that the suprascapular nerve block is better than the intraarticular steroid injection in terms of pain relief and functional improvement. Study of Dr. Jung and Atale found that combined the suprascapular nerve block with the intraarticular steroid injection is better than the isolated intraarticular steroid injection. Combined the suprascapular nerve block with the PT is better than the isolated PT. Combined the suprascapular nerve block with the hydrodilatation is better than the isolated hydrodilatation. Systematic reviews and meta-analysis of Dr. Jump found that superscapular nerve block for the frozen shoulder provide good results in terms of pain relief and range of motion. Another study of Dr. Fabeji found that superscapular nerve block for the frozen shoulder has the moderate evidence of the effectiveness compared to the possible and steroid injection. How about the manipulation under the superscapular nerve block? It also provides good results in terms of pain relief and range of motion. 
So both superscapular nerve block and the manipulation under superscapular nerve block are the efficacious treatment options for the frozen shoulder. Two main, two main techniques of the superscapular nerve block are the landmark guided technique and the other cell guided technique. But both cadaveric study and clinical study found that there's no difference between two techniques. So both techniques have the comparable efficacy and it's quite practical at the outpatient clinic. So I prefer the landmark guided technique. But actually, there are many landmark guided techniques. They are different in the using a reference for the direction of the needle. But all of them are inconsistent reference, such as some technique use skin as a reference, like Kekuchi and more, they direct the needle perpendicular to the skin. But use skin as the reference is depend on the body of the patient. Some technique use body axis as a reference, such as Masumoto and Meyer. It also depends on the sitting position of the patient, which affect the axis of the scapula. Some techniques use bone as a reference, such as Danko's. They direct the needle parallel to the scapula blade. Barber direct the needle toward the crocoid. I think this is quite using imagination. So I prefer my technique using the acromion as the reference by direct the needle just right angle to the lateral border of the chromium and about 50 degrees from the upper surface of the chromium. This will direct the needle close to the suprascapular notch, which is the proper location for injection. It was confirmed by the arthroscopic wheel. Usually after calf repair, I put the scope close to the suprascapular notch. And using this landmark guided technique, the needle will be directed close to the suprascapular artery and nerve, which is the proper location for injection to control the post-operative pain. Besides the suprascapular nerve block, I also add the axillary nerve block and the lateral pectoral nerve block. Study of Dr. Nam found that Axillary nerve is about 4.7 4 centimeters from the postal lateral border of the chromium with a depth of 2 centimeters. Another study of Dr. Nam found that the lateral pectoral nerve is at the midpoint of the shorter distance between the crocoid and the clavicle with a depth of 1 centimeter. So I perform the triple nerve block with the interarticular injection by using the marking and tramcinolone for the suprascapular nerve block and the axillary nerve block, and using the lidocaine with the methylpenicillin for the interarticular injection and the lateral pectoral nerve block. Then, do the manipulation 45 minutes later with a good result. So, there's no single treatment options is the best for the frozen shoulder. Combine a triple nerve block with other treatment options is effective, practical, inexpensive, and safe, and can be maximized the efficacy of the conservative treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pachan. That was very interesting. Um, next speaker will be Dr. Reynaldi Pasatia. Uh, good afternoon, all the audience. Thank you very much for the organizing. Thank you very much for the chairman also and organizing committee who uh, organized this fabulous event. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Renaldi Prasatya. Uh, I would like to share a little bit about uh, the trend to treat about the frozen shoulder in a conservative treatment. As we know that the frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis occur in the 2 until 5% in the adults with a peak incidence about 40 until 60 years old. And etiology is unclear, but and there's 
no consensus of the type of a treatment the most effective in patients with a frozen shoulder. The, um, these conditions was uh, developed and can be diagnosed with uh, several criteria, especially the physical examination, while the functional restrictions, especially for the active and passive range of motions, but there are no remarkable radiograph. The chronic inflammatory process will create a thickening and contractile shoulder capsule, and we have to find out with a diagnosis of the exclusions, which the etiology that become uh, the frozen shoulder occur, or there are no uh, etiology, or we don't know the etiology, we, like, we call it the idiopathic or primary. The natural history is continued debating. It's a self-limiting disease, but some patients show absolutely no improvement over the time and show only mild improvement followed by plateauing. This is the pathology of progressions creating a, from the stage one is a freezing phase while well, a dominant inflammatory. They are increasing of inflammatory cytokines, synovitis, and pain to move the shoulder. And this occurs prolongs and intense, creating the inflammatory uh, uh, creating a fibrotic reactions and transforming of fibroblasts, creating a contractures of the capsules. And from frozen phase, there are a dominant arthrofibrosis, while there are a thickening of a rotator interval, thickening of the axillary recess, arthrofibrosis, and additions of the subacromial agria. And the towing phase is recovery, and it's a self-limiting disease. But we cannot confirm to the patient when it will be recovered. Uh, so this is the clinically, uh, the patient got a thickening on the uh, synovitis first and the thickening of the anterior part of the capsules and also the ligaments, creating the limitation on external rotation and limitation of inductions. In the clinical setting, I usually using the ultrasounds to confirm the diagnosis because uh, there are some kind of criteria, even though we uh, make sure that the patients have a primary idiopathic scale, uh, frozen shoulder, but while we confirm it, a history of endocrine problems, and also the, the MRI, there are some kind of a, uh, pathology that find the MRI. So they convert everything from the primary uh, frozen shoulder into the secondary frozen shoulder. So in the ultrasound sense evaluation, we can confirm this is something of a thickening using the coracohumeral ligament uh, thickening while well, we uh, evaluate it in the static ultrasound evaluation. And ultrasound can also evaluate with dynamic ultrasound oscillations while well, there are some kind of loss of exclusion of the subscapulars because while well, the internal rotation occur because uh, of the thickening of the anterior capsules. And from the uh, dynamic evaluation, while well, the kind of thickening of the inferior capsule, there have uh, limitations or loss of exclusion in the supraspinatus. In the, uh, under the subacromial space. And MRI can also di diagnose it with a thickening of a capsule in the axillary recesses. So in the uh, stage, well, the freezing phase, what we do is probably start with oral steroid. It can be done. Several uh, literature mentioned that. Uh, and after that, if uh, there are no progression, if there are no uh, some kind of improvement, we can uh, inject like a steroid injections. And from the frozen phase, we can doing the hydrodilatations with a steroid first, uh, with a, a suprascapular nerve block. So, corticoid injections with hydrodilatations, uh, sometimes patients come to us in the late of the stage one and early of the stage two with uh, still pain and also uh, restriction of the motion. On this kind of a conditions, sometimes I'm uh, we'll, we'll do the hydrodilatation with a steroid and also with a saline 20cc. But this process will create pain and creating the incompliance of the patients. So that's why we do the suprascapular nerve block beforehand. Uh, and some literature mentioned the suprascapular nerve block can be add or can be the main therapy for the stage last, uh, stage one or the stage two of the frozen shoulder. So this is the literature, a journal that uh, we publish. We but we inject the suprascapular nerve in the spinoglenoid notch. Uh, why? Because the less uh, motoric uh, innervation at the time, uh, so uh, it's, uh, pro uh, mostly it's a uh, sensory nerve block. Uh, we put the, uh, our uh, probe, linear probe, in the uh, below of the posterior lateral of the acromions, and then uh, we identify there are spinoglenoid notch, and after that. We insert the echogenic of the needles from the medial to the laterals to inject the mixtures between uh, the 
uh, one point uh, one compare ones of the zilocaine and also the uh, bupivacaine for the short and the long acting Anastasia agents. And after that, we uh, inject the glunohumeral injections using the steroid uh, 40 milligram and expand with uh, 20 cc of the uh, salients until we proving that the humeral head was pushed, uh, sorry, pulled uh, far away from the glenoid uh, area. We can see here in the pictures that the capsule distended and the humeral head far away from the uh, glenoid. Uh, we also published the papers about the result that the consensus said it's convenient for the patient because uh, there are some kind of uh, improvement intra, uh, what is that, intra, uh, intra procedure. So the patient will feel convenience uh, while the uh, capsule dilated and uh, probably without any pain and also creating a compliance because we can directly doing the exercise to the patient with a manual exercise. But don't forget the manual exercise is important because manual exercise or home exercise can be performed every time in the, uh, in the home, not the physiotherapy, but physiotherapy can be also added to record it, the progress of the patients during range of motion and also the symptoms of the pain. Uh, so that, uh, I promote in this case is uh, using the suprascapular nerve block and also the hydrodilatations that in this case uh, they provide pain, uh, it's supplying sensory nerve block at 70% of the uh, capsules and promote uh, convenience in the hydrodilatations and also uh, increasing the compliance of the manual exercise or home exercise. I think that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lashit. And the last speaker will be the, um, Dr. Phan Ding Mung from Vietnam. Dr. Mung, are you be here? No? Okay, maybe. Uh -huh. So, uh, we have only three speakers. Uh, next, we're going to move on to the second part, which is the uh, surgical treatment. We will continue in the same order of presentation as previous. Uh, so, may I invite Dr. Siti again? And any question regarding to the conservative treatment or surgical treatment? come to be in the f final part of the, this session. Dr. Siti, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'm back up here again. Okay, next is surgical treatment for frozen shoulder. Uh, in my practice, uh, I use surgical treatment uh, of this offered for patients in phase two and phase three. So I had already mentioned just now what are phases for two and three. This phase two is the one with the most painful period. And I also uh, offered patients for surgery with, with, with when there is no improvement with conservative treatment or very little progress with conservative treatment, especially within six months. So usually I give them this much of chance, three to six months before the surgery. What I do is arthroscopic pencapsular release. It just means that uh, the anterior, the inferior, and the posterior capsules are released. The rotator interval being the culprit here is usually the ones that is released first. And most of the time, I approach this from the glenohumeral joint uh, to perform this procedure. However, there will be times, very occasions, that I will, if I think I have difficulty entering the glenohumeral joint from the posterior portal, then I would approach this uh, from the subacromial space instead. So bicep stenotomy um, is not a routine. I am not a fan of bicep stenotomy unless it is really indicated. So I would consider doing it only when it is pathological. So whether uh, the manipulation under anesthesia is necessary, 
I don't do this as a routine as well. However, if I need to, it, I will sort of like leave it until the last when everything is completed, when all the reviews is completed. Because uh, I realized with the MUE before, prior to the surgery, and it becomes a bit bloody during arthroscopy. Um, intraarticular steroids, yes, I do give this uh, immediately after the uh, procedure in the intraarticular uh, joint. Uh, for the uh, type of anesthesia, uh, I always ask my anesthetist uh, to give the patient's regional block uh, for post-op pain management, always, because I realize without it, uh, my patients actually will have a recurrence, the pain control is very poor, and eventually they will end up with not a good outcome as expected. And physiotherapy, of course, uh, in day one itself, uh, day zero itself, you know, when the patient is still like pain-free, you start the uh, range of motion exercises almost immediately. So after establishing the uh, portal, uh, standard arthro diagnostic arthroscopy is performed in the standard manner. Uh, so in this video, it's just showing uh, the release of the anterior capsule, the inferior capsule, and the posterior capsule. Uh, but actually, after making a diagnostic arthroscopy, uh, the rotator interval should be the one targeted first. That has to be released because most of the time during arthroscopy, uh, that is so much narrowed. So after releasing the rotator interval, uh, if the biceps is pathological, then I would tenotomy to me the biceps. Then once it is wider, and most of the time, uh, it, you can have access into the anterior uh, interval, or sorry, anterior capsule, then the arthroscopy will be changed uh, to the anterosuperolateral portal uh, to, view the, to view the inter inferior capsule. So this is more space then, then the sequence is going to be like that. So inferior capsule, anterior IGHL, and then uh, change the scope to the anterior to uh, view the posterior capsule, then eventually release the posterior capsule from top to bottom. And lastly is the postero inferior portal, in postero inferior capsule release. So, uh, in terms of sequence, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the release starts from the rotator interval always. And the carpohemoral ligament being as one of the culprits as well, is always tightened, very tight there. So that has to be released. Uh, once there is space there, then uh, the, uh, the biceps, then next is followed by the capsule, which is the anterior first, to the inferior, and through inferior, including the IGHL, the MGHL as well. And then uh, to the posterior, uh, top to bottom, and the viewing portal will be changed accordingly. If you want to view from the anterosuperolateral portal for the inferior capsule, and then I would view from the anterior portal to view the posterior capsule. So once it can be completed, uh, then you can have uh, the, if needed, the MUA, or most of the time I don't need it, and it, the range of motion, once it is completed, it should be full. So with that, I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And next speaker will be Dr. Prashant Manchasik. Uh, the part two, we're going to talk about the surgical treatment of the frozen shoulder. So I'm going to talk about my preference. Um, for the surgical treatment as a capsular release, I prefer the subacomia pose, which proposed by Dr. Laurent LaForce. This technique can prevent the articular cartilage injury, and it can release the CSL completely. The four main procedures of the ACR include the capsular release, rotator interval tissue removal, 
The most important is the CSL should be released completely and free subscapularis by excision of the rotator involved tissue superiorly, release HGSL and MGSL posteriorly, and decompress the subclocoid space, and also do the subacromial adhesion release. I start with the subacromial post and release any adhesion of both the subacromial space and the subdeltoid space. Step two, rotator interval tissue removal. I said that uh, CSL is the most important. CSL is a thick ligament attached from the base of cochlea to the GT and LT. The band which it attached to the lesser tuberosity will bend to the upper border of the subscapularis. This is the viewing from the mid-lateral portal of the right shoulder. We start with the uh, subcrochoid compression. Then, sorry. We start with the subcrochoid compression. Then we can identify the crochoid and the conchoid tendon. Right here. And when we move medially, we can see a thick ligament of the CSL attached from the base of crochoid to the lesser tuberosity. And we start to release the CSL from the base of crochoid. It should be released completely. Until we can see the elbow right here at the base of crochoid. And then we excise laterally. Next step, entering the genohemorrhoid joint. After excision of the CSL laterally, then we can see the upper border of the subscapularis using switching stick pierced into the genohemorrhoid joint just above the upper border of the subscapularis. And then viewing through the anterior portal, we can create the posterior portal gently and start to release the posterior capsule. Then we switch the scope to the posterior portal. We can see the thick rotator interval tissue anteriorly, and we start to free the subscapularis by excise the rotator interval tissue superiorly until we can see the window of the rotator interval and then we move forward and release any adhesion in front of the subscapularis laterally. And when we move medially, we complete the subcrochoid decompression. Then we go back to release the MGSL behind the subscapularis. And we also free the subscapularis out of the crinoid neck. And release the entry band of the IGSL. Finally, we complete the inflate capsular release. After surgery, we do the manipulation. And the post-operative pain control is very important. I always do the interoperative superscapular nerve block by put the scope close to the superscapular notch and use the landmark guided technique. The needle will be dilated close to the superscapular notch to block the nerve. KFC stands for the ketololex. F is a fentanyl and a corticosteroid. With the dose of the ketolac is about 1 to 2 milligram per kilo per day. Fentanyl is 1 to 2 microgram per kilo per hour. And I use the hydrocortisone, 1 to 5 milligram per kilo per day. Then give the patient the instruction of the home exercise. So I, I prefer the subacromia pose and perform the flow main procedures. And the post-operative pain control is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bachan. And um, the video is quite
clear and I love KFC. Okay, next speaker will be Dr. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, so in this uh, surgery section, uh, we prefer surgery while there are prolonged shoulder pain and shoulder stiffness. And uh, we think we should consider to do the operations about six months after conservative in primary frozen shoulder and three months after conservative in secondary frozen shoulder. Uh, select, we perform the selective uh, release, rotator interval and anterior inferior capsules, and doing the manipulations uh, is the first option. So, uh, but beforehand, we need to identify are there any secondary problems that we should face, such as uh, the intrinsic problem, intraarticular problems, such as labrum problems, or slap problems, or long head bicep tendon problems, synovitis problems, and probably the extrinsic is a rotator cuff or AC joint arthritis problem. So we have to search by one using the MRI or using another further investigations. Uh, after that, we have a plan to treat it as well while we're doing the arthroscopic surgery. So routinely, uh, and the anesthesiologist will perform the interscanus block under ultrasound, and then they will put uh, uh, some kind of a continue uh, of the uh, distributions of the anesthetic agents can be maintained after the operations using the patient control analgesia or the continue uh, infusions of the uh, anesthesia agents with a small concentrations and small volumes so, so that not block the motoric but uh, can decrease the sensations. So after that, we're doing the uh, initial evaluations and doing the rotator interval release and then do, continue with uh, uh, MGHL, IGHL, and anterior inferior capsules. Uh, so uh, continue with a subacromial release. And then we perform the manipulation using the fear, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external rotation, and internal rotations to creating further circumferential release. And sometimes we have to evaluate there are any limitation or not in the adduction or internal rotations. If there are some kind of obstruction in the adduction internal rotation, so probably we need to come in again intraarticularly and change the viewing portal from anterior to do the circumferential release. Uh, continue with the posterior inferior capsule, goes to the posterior and so on. So directly, uh, one day, we can perform the manual exercise uh, to obtain the passive range of motion exercise to give the patient experience that uh, the uh, patient can act doing the exercise without or with uh, decreasing pain using the pain controlling. And then uh, we achieve the full range of motion in the six months. Usually in the three or four months, the patient can doing well with the uh, manual exercise and also the physiotherapy to regulate it and also to record uh, about the progressions day by uh, in, in each week. So this is the result of the literatures about the uh, 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 capsule release and the manipulations. It said that uh, the fast score and also the constant score and the range of motion was increasing pre and post operatively in two years. So uh, this is another treatment, it uh, directly goes to 363 arthroscopic capsule release, but we do selectively. So as a summary, prolonged shoulder pain and the stiffness we have to consider about the operations, usually six months after the conservative in the primary frozen shoulder and the three months after the conservative in secondary frozen shoulder, and selective release and manipulations is my first option and can be continued with uh, uh, 360 capsule release if there are severe mo motion limitation, especially in adduction and internal rotations. Thank you very much for listening to my presentations. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rashid. And now we have Dr. Phan Ding Mung from Vietnam coming back from the... Huh? 
Okay, sorry, we have only three speakers. So, um, does anyone have any question? Uh, please feel free to ask them and come up to the microphone, please. Uh, I'm Joe from South Korea. I wanted to ask to all presenters, how percentage uh, did you perform, do you perform the operative treatment in all your, uh, the frozen shoulder cases? 10% or 5% and 20%? Dr. Prachan? How percentage, how many percentage do you perform the operative treatment operative. in your case? For me, I think that's less than 10%. Less than 10%. Quite low, I think. Yes, in the primary, it's 10 until 20% so we're doing the operations. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the great talks. I'm uh, Dr. Bia Pon, a physiatrist from Hui Pon Hospital. Uh, so I have one question. I, I understand from the conservative pers perspective, you said you prefer to do cortisol, cortisol injection first, right? And then hydrodilatation later. So when will you choose that, okay, you're gonna go and go to do the hydrodilatations? Any indications? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the questions. So, uh, usually patients come to us in the last stage of the first phase, that there are still inflammatory process that's creating any pain, but there are some kind of major of stiffness, especially in the abduction and external rotation. So it's what start to translate transitions between the first stage into two stage, second stage. So at that time, uh, I perform uh, usually the suprascapular nerve block uh, first to block the nociceptors while we're doing the hydrodilatation because the hydrodilatation is creating the stretching of the capsules and activating the nociceptors. They're creating the somatic pain or nociceptor pain. And to decrease the inflammation in the late stage of the first, uh, the first phase, uh, we put the intraarticular uh, in, steroid, uh, triamcinolone 40 milligrams. But we do not put any anesthetic agent inside the intraarticulars because as some literature mentioned it will the cardio uh, this uh, cartilage damage to the uh, chondrocytes. So and continue with the hydrodilatation about 15 until 20 cc. Actually, this is a variative because we using the ultrasound, so we directly can evaluate the uh, motions or the movement of the humeral heads far away from the glenoid. After that, uh, the hydrodilatation is over. Uh, the, the, we end the procedures. Uh, that's all. Uh, so is this mean that this is your first joint of injection options? So no interarticular steroid straight? Just go with the hydrodilatation right away, right? Uh, we, mix, we mix the okay, uh, steroid, yes. interarticular steroid and the anesthetic uh, agent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, and the uh, saline. Okay, and, and for, I, I, I understand that another doctors, you do injection first, right? And then you do hydrolytation later. Is there any indication for you to send uh, the referral? Uh, yeah, I actually do, I give a chance of steroid injection first, especially in phase one because of the acute pain. Uh, however, once the pain starts to reduce and when starts having the limitation of range of motion, because the first phase, there is not much of range a limitation in terms of ROM is in the second phase when you have in between. So you have limited range of motion, but pain is reducing, and that's when I would consider sending patient for hydrodilatation. I think that's a good question, thank you. Uh, for me, I think there's a intarticular sterile injection is to, uh, to reduce the inflammation in the early stage, like a facing phase. But uh, for the hydrodilatation, I call it at the end of conservative treatment because uh, the result is quite the same as manipulation. But the advantage is that it has less cause, less complication. But uh, anyway, the, the, the res clinical result in terms of uh, persistent external rotation is still persist because hydrodilatation cannot uh, release the CSL and all the rotator interval. 
And also in the diabetic patient, it's quite the same as the MUA. The high dilatation and the MUA maybe have less efficacy in the diabetic patient. So in general, I do the entire articular steroid injection in early state. High dilatation in the late frozen states. Uh, hello, myself, uh, Dr. Sharath from India. Uh, I would like to know that uh, uh, the suprascapular nerve block is an outpatient procedure you do in the clinic or you send it to anesthetist or uh, can it be done uh, without the probe or with this, uh, you all, do you always require that uh, probe? Yeah, uh, actually I think this is an uh, advantage of the suprascapular nerve block over the interscaline because if we do the interscaline, we have to consult the anesthetologist, right? But for the suprascapular nerve block, we can do it at the outpatient clinic. And literature says that the uh, landmark guided techniques and the other side guided techniques is quite comparable. So we can do the landmark guided technique. And it, Right now, we do is as an indirect approach. It's different from the direct approach. Indirect approach, we just put the needle to the suprascapular fossa, which is quite safe to prevent the pneumotolet. And the tip of the needle is just passed uh, through the supraspinatus. When it passes the inferior fascia of the supraspinatus and go to the suprascapular fossa, this area, even just 5 ml of the anesthetic agent can cover the suprascapular nerve. So the answer is that I do it at the outpatient kidney. Or uh, do you put the needle in the OR uh, under CR image or in the outpatient itself? Outpatient itself. Uh, in the ne needle, do you check in the CR in the operation theater or in the OP OPD itself, outpatient? Y yes. Uh, uh, he's, uh, I think he's asked that uh, this procedure of uh, uh, the nerve block is, uh, per, uh, is performed at the outpatient clinic or at the, in the OR room, operation theater. At the, at the outpatient clinic. Okay. Yeah. Can I? Can I, can I, I? Oh, sorry. Okay. So in my case, uh, I'm doing the suprascapular nerve block is using the ultrasound. So the patient in, in, the, in the outpatient clinics. So, but why I'm not using uh, the anatomical landmark? Because the target of my injections is located in the spinoglenoid nodge. So that uh, the branches to the, uh, to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus is already uh, go through and there's 70 percent about the uh, nerve ends to the to the glenohumeral joints so we put the probe is located uh, two centimeter below the posterior lateral of acromions and then we notice about the glenohumeral joints and we see the probes to the medial part until we can see the notch and after that we inject it from the medial to the laterals something like that so it can be uh, visualized by the ultrasound. Yes, thank you. May I have a question to Dr. Lachis? In your presentation that you point the needle under the south to the spinal kinoid notch, right? Why don't you put to the suprascapular notch? Because as we know that the sensory bands, it just come out behind the uh, spinal kinoid notch. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, we make also uh, some kind of uh, research about uh, the, uh, the, we do not do the research in the cadaveric study, but we differentiate between doing the injection in the suprascapular and also spinoglenoid. So, it's uh, quite uh, similar about the result uh, of the decreasing of the pain during the hydrodilatations. So while we're doing the injection in the spinoglenoid notch, we can easily identify also the glenohumeral joint at one point. So it can be also in the one single injection using spinoglenoid notch, and if you use a 100 uh, uh, millimeters of uh, uh, echogenic uh, needles, we can go directly also to the glenohumeral joint with a single portal. That's all. Yes, please. 
I want to ask uh, a question uh, for all the, all the uh, speakers about the uh, if you uh, you know the uh, frozen the diagnosis of frozen shoulder is uh, exclusive diagnosis in the um, outpatient clinic uh, in the clinic settings. Uh, but if you want to perform a prospective study, for example, randomized control study, then uh, if you do not use MRI screening, then some some part of patients will with rotator cuff tear, partial or uh, full sickness, uh, will be enrolled into the patient without MR scanning. Because uh, although this is a low percentage, but there is a secondary uh, adhesive capsulitis of the shoulder in this kind of patients. Uh, so what's your opinion if you are going to perform a prospective randomized control trial, Will you use the MRI scanning as our inclusion criteria to exclude the secondary uh, frozen shoulder uh, or, uh, after the rotate cuff here? Thank you. That's a good point because uh, in the early state of the frozen shoulder, sometimes the clinical appearance is quite the same as the rotator cuff tendinitis or partial tear. But in my opinion, I think that the physical examination is important. As uh, in the frozen shoulder, I think that most of the patients have the tenderness of the coracoid compared to the rotator cuff is tenderness at the GT. And also the painful resistance in this case of the frozen shoulder, they have, uh, mostly have the painful resistance in internal rotation. But mostly for the rotator cuff, have the painful and external rotation. And we also have to do uh, like a follow up uh, progression. In the frozen shoulder, we gradually see that the range of motion can be worse, particularly in the external rotation. But for the rotator cuff problem, uh, the progression is mainly in the forward elevation and external rotation. So in your point, we actually in the, our clinical practice, we don't do the MRI in the patient of the frozen shoulder, but we gotta look at the physical clinical appearance first. Yeah, yeah, uh, I got a point, but the problem is that if you are going to perform a randomized control trial prospectively, multi-center, then you cannot uh, standardize the, the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, uh, because the training of the different centers, the, the, the orthopedic surgeon that is enrolled into the, uh, into the uh, multi center study will be different. So uh, you cannot standardize the training of them. So uh, if you use clinical exclu exclusive diagnostic criteria that was usually used in the uh, in the clinical settings all over the world, then there will be problem in the, uh, you in mistakenly enroll some patients with, with that kind of, uh, although it's uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, in, in the clinical setting, but uh, if it is not a pragmatic study, uh, but it's a traditional randomized control study with strict inclusion criteria, will you recommend to, uh, to use MRI scanning uh, to into the criteria, uh, encouraging criteria like that. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, actually, the, if we, uh, thank you very much for the questions. So actually for the diagnosis of the frozen shoulder itself, it uh, can be built clinically uh, for the uh, limitation of the ex a passive and also active range of motions, uh, external rotations, and also the abductions or global range of motions. Uh, without any remarkable uh, x-ray evaluations, sign, something like that. That's the Zuckerman criteria. But uh, if we want to do the prospective, like a randomized clinical trial, probably it's important if we want to use MRI, if we want to differentiate between the primary and secondary frozen shoulder become our populations. Because there are some literatures in the, I think from South Korea, they mentioned that we sometimes uh, underestimated about the primary frozen shoulder while we doing the uh, secondary frozen shoulder, while we doing the MRI, the diagnosis changes almost all into the secondary frozen shoulder because they find the pathology 
uh, at the MRI. So I think uh, we need to do the MRI while we want to uh, conclude that uh, our population, when we're doing the prospective randomized clinical trial, uh, as one definition, uh, is that a primary or is that a secondary? I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And my, I have also another question, actually, about the staging of the frozen shoulder. Is there anyone to, uh, maybe I can give the chance to other one if one to continue asking. But if there are no, uh, IR has another question about the staging. Because you know, the, in, the, in our clinical settings, the staging of the frozen shoulder, we, we are taught in the textbook that uh, there are several stages. But in the clinic settings, they overlap a lot, and there are a lot of variations in the in the staging. So uh, in the clinical setting, we, we can talk about this and uh, we, we, uh, tell, uh, we, we talk about it in, in how to treat it in different stages. But in the, in the uh, study, in the clinical studying setting, uh, the staging, uh, if the, the interviewer will, uh, will ask you which staging of your patients, then actually it is quite difficult to, uh, to enroll are certain stage of patients, say two, stage one, or say stage three. So uh, do you think it's staging since it's quite a clinical setting uh, useful, but uh, in the uh, clinical study setting, it is uh, required to, uh, to uh, tell us uh, which stage is the patient you enrolled, or you just tell you them that year, less than one year, and uh, uh, longer than one year. Thank you for your suggestion. All right, good point, and um, the time is up, so we're going to close this session, and thank you very much for the all great presentation. Thank you, um, everything for the audience. Okay, thank you. Thank you.